I should have preferred her to give it up, that, yes. But I made no fuss about it. It caused no point of dissension between you? Certainly not. My wife was free to please herself. And, the marriage was a happy one? Kenneth Marshall said coldly. Certainly. Colonel Weston paused a minute. Then he said, Captain Marshall, have you any idea who could possibly have killed your wife? The answer came without the least hesitation. None whatever. Had she any enemies? Possibly. Ah. The other went on quickly. He said, Don't misunderstand me, sir. My wife was an actress. She was also a very good-looking woman. In both capacities she aroused a certain amount of jealousy and envy. There were fusses over parts, there was rivalry from other women, there was a good deal, shall we say, of general envy, hatred, malice, and all uncharitableness. But that is not to say that there was anyone who was capable of deliberately murdering her. Hercule Poirot spoke for the first time. He said, What you really mean, monsieur, is that her enemies were mostly, or entirely, women? Kenneth Marshall looked across at him. Yes, he said. That is so. The chief constable said. You know of no man who had a grudge against her? No. Was she previously acquainted with anyone in this hotel? I believe she had met Mr. Redfern before, at some cocktail party. Nobody else to my knowledge. Weston paused. He seemed to deliberate as to whether to pursue the subject. Then he decided against that course. He said, We now come to this morning. When was the last time you saw your wife? Marshall paused a minute, then he said, I looked in on my way down to breakfast. Excuse me, you occupied separate rooms? Yes. And what time was that? It must have been about nine o'clock. What was she doing? She was opening her letters. Did she say anything? Nothing of any particular interest. Just good morning, and that it was a nice day, that sort of thing. What was her manner? Unusual at all? No, perfectly normal. She did not seem excited, or depressed, or upset in any way. I certainly didn't notice it. Hercule Poro said. Did she mention at all what were the contents of her letters? Again a faint smile appeared on Marshall's lips. He said. As far as I can remember, she said they were all bills. Your wife breakfasted in bed? Yes. Did she always do that? Invariably. Hercule Poro said. What time did she usually come downstairs? Oh. Between 10 and 11, usually nearer 11. Poro went on. If she was to descend at 10 o'clock exactly, that would be rather surprising? Yes. She wasn't often down as early as that. But she was this morning. Why do you think that was, Captain Marshall? Marshall said unemotionally. Haven't the least idea. Might have been the weather, extra fine day and all that. You missed her? Kenneth Marshall shifted a little in his chair. He said. Looked in on her again after breakfast. Room was empty. I was a bit surprised. And then you came down on the beach and asked me if I had seen her? Air, yes. He added with a faint emphasis in his voice. And you said you hadn't. The innocent eyes of Hercule Poirot did not falter. Gently he caressed his large and flamboyant mustache. Weston asked. Had you any special reason for wanting to find your wife this morning? Marshall shifted his glance amiably to the chief constable. He said. No, just wondered where she was, that's all. Weston paused. He moved his chair slightly. His voice fell into a different key. He said. Just now, Captain M. Arshall, you mentioned that your wife had a previous acquaintance with Mr. Patrick Redfern. How well did your wife know Mr. Redfern? Kenneth Marshall said. Mind if I smoke? 
he felt through his pockets. Dash. I've mislaid my pipe somewhere. Poirot offered him a cigarette which he accepted. Lighting it, he said. You were asking about Redfern. My wife told me she had come across him at some cocktail party or other. He was, then, just a casual acquaintance. I believe so. Since then, the chief constable paused. I understand that that acquaintanceship has ripened into something rather closer. Marshall said sharply. You understand that, do you? Who told you so? It is the common gossip of the hotel. For a moment Marshall's eyes went to Hercule Poirot. They dwelt on him with a kind of cold anger. He said. Hotel gossip is usually a tissue of lies. Possibly. But I gather that Mr. Redfern and your wife gave some grounds for the gossip. What grounds? They were constantly in each other's company. Is that all? You do not deny that that was so? May have been. I really didn't notice. You did not, excuse me, Captain Marshall, object to your wife's friendship with Mr. Redfern? I wasn't in the habit of criticizing my wife's conduct. You did not protest or object in any way? Certainly not. Not even though it was becoming a subject of scandal and an estrangement was growing up between Mr. Redfern and his wife? Kenneth Marshall said coldly. I mind my own business and I expect other people to mind theirs. I don't listen to gossip and tittle-tattle. You won't deny that Mr. Redfern admired your wife? He probably did. Most men did. She was a very beautiful woman. But you yourself were persuaded that there was nothing serious in the affair? I never thought about it, I tell you. And suppose we have a witness who can testify that they were on terms of the greatest intimacy. Again those blue eyes went to Hercule Poirot. Again an expression of dislike showed on that usually impassive face. Marshall said. If you want to listen to these tales, listen to them. My wife's dead and can't defend herself. You mean that you, personally, don't believe them? For the first time a faint dew of sweat was observable on Marshall's brow. He said. I don't propose to believe anything of the kind. He went on. Aren't you getting a good way from the essentials of this business? What I believe or don't believe is surely not relevant to the plain fact of murder. Hercule Poirot answered before either of the others could speak. He said. You do not comprehend, Captain Marshall. There is no such thing as a plain fact of murder. Murder springs, nine times out of ten, out of the character and circumstances of the murdered person. Because the victim was the kind of person he or she was, therefore was he or she murdered. Until we can understand fully and completely exactly what kind of a person Arlena Marshall was, we shall not be able to see clearly exactly the kind of person who murdered her. From that springs the necessity of our questions. Marshall turned to the chief constable. He said. That your view, too? Weston boggled a little. He said. Well, up to a point, that is to say. Marshall gave a short laugh. He said. Thought you wouldn't agree. This character stuff is M. Poro's specialty, I believe. Poro said, smiling. You can at least congratulate yourself on having done nothing to assist me. What do you mean? What have you told us about your wife? Exactly nothing at all. You have told us only what everyone could see for themselves. That she was beautiful and admired. Nothing more. Kenneth Marshall shrugged his shoulders. He said simply. You're crazy. He looked towards the chief constable and said with emphasis. Anything else, sir, that you'd like me to tell you? Yes, Captain Marshall, your own movements this morning, please. Kenneth Marshall nodded. He had clearly expected this. He said. I breakfasted downstairs about nine o'clock as usual and read the paper. As I told you I went up to my wife's room afterwards and found she had gone out. I came down to the beach, saw him, Poirot and asked if he had seen her. 
then I had a quick bathe and went up to the hotel again. It was then, let me see, about 20 to 11, yes, just about that. I saw the clock in the lounge. It was just after 20 minutes too. I went up to my room, but the chambermaid hadn't quite finished it. I asked her to finish as quickly as she could. I had some letters to type which I wanted to get off by the post. I went downstairs again and had a word or two with Henry in the bar. I went up again to my room at 10 minutes to 11. There I typed my letters. I typed until 10 minutes to 12. I then changed into tennis kit as I had a date to play tennis at 12. We'd booked the court the day before. Who was we? Mrs. Redfern, Miss Darnley, Mr. Gardner and myself. I came down at 12 o'clock and went up to the court. Miss Darnley was there and Mr. Gardner. Mrs. Redfern arrived a few minutes later. We played tennis for an hour. Just as we came into the hotel afterwards I, I, got the news. Thank you, Captain Marshall. Just as a matter of form, is there anyone who can corroborate the fact that you were typing in your room between, er, 10 minutes to 11 and 10 minutes to 12? Kenneth Marshall said with a faint smile. Have you got some idea that I killed my own wife? Let me see now. The chambermaid was about doing the rooms. She must have heard the typewriter going. And then there are the letters themselves. With all this upset I haven't posted them. I should imagine they are as good evidence as anything. He took three letters from his pocket. They were addressed, but not stamped. He said. Their contents, by the way, are strictly confidential. But when it's a case of murder, one is forced to trust in the discretion of the police. They contain lists of figures and various financial statements. I think you will find that if you put one of your men on to type them out, he won't do it in much under an hour. He paused. Satisfied, I hope? Weston said smoothly. It is no question of suspicion. Everyone on the island will be asked to account for his or her movements between a quarter to eleven and twenty minutes to twelve this morning. Kenneth Marshall said. Quite. Weston said. One more thing, Captain Marshall. Do you know anything about the way your wife was likely to have disposed of any property she had? You mean a will? I don't think she ever made a will. But you are not sure? Her solicitors are Barkett, Marquette and Applegood, Bedford Square. They sought all her contracts, etc. But I'm fairly certain she never made a will. She said once that doing a thing like that would give her the shivers. In that case, if she has died intestate, you, as her husband, succeed to her property. Yes, I suppose I do. Had she any near relatives? I don't think so. If she had, she never mentioned them. I know that her father and mother died when she was a child and she had no brothers or sisters. In any case, I suppose, she had nothing very much to leave? Kenneth Marshall said coldly. On the contrary. Only two years ago, Sir Robert Erskine, who was an old friend of hers, died and left her most of his fortune. It amounted, I think, to about 50,000 pounds. Inspector Colgate looked up. An alertness came into his glance. Up to now he had been silent. Now he asked. Then actually, Captain Marshall, your wife was a rich woman. Kenneth Marshall shrugged his shoulders. I suppose she was really. And you still say she did not make a will? You can ask the solicitors. But I'm pretty certain she didn't. As I tell you, she thought it unlucky. There was a pause then Marshall added. Is there anything further? Weston shook his head. Don't think so, at Colgate? No. Once more, Captain Marshall, let me offer you all my sympathy in your loss. Marshall blinked. He said jerkily. Oh, thanks. He went out. The three men looked at each other. Weston said. Cool customer. Not giving anything away, is he? What do you make of him, Colgate? 
the inspector shook his head. It's difficult to tell. He's not the kind that shows anything. That sort makes a bad impression in the witness box, and yet it's a bit unfair on them really. Sometimes they're as cut up as anything and yet can't show it. That kind of manner made the jury bring in a verdict of guilty against Wallace. It wasn't the evidence. They just couldn't believe that a man could lose his wife and talk and act so coolly about it. Weston turned to Poirot. What do you think, Poirot? Hercule Poirot raised his hands. He said. What can one say? He is the closed box, the fastened oyster. He has chosen his role. He has heard nothing, he has seen nothing, he knows nothing. We've got a choice of motives, said Colgate. There's jealousy and there's the money motive. Of course, in a way, a husband's the obvious suspect. One naturally thinks of him first. If he knew his missus was carrying on with the other chap. Poro interrupted. He said. I think he knew that. Why do you say so? Listen, my friend. Last night I had been talking with Mrs. Redfern on Sunny Ledge. I came down from there to the hotel and on my way I saw those two together, Mrs. Marshall and Patrick Redfern. In a moment or two after I met Captain Marshall. His face was very stiff. It says nothing, but nothing at all. It is almost too blank, if you understand me. Oh. He knew all right. Colgate grunted doubtfully. He said. Oh well, if you think so. I am sure of it. But even then, what does that tell us? What did Kenneth Marshall feel about his wife? Colonel Weston said. Takes her death coolly enough. Poro shook his head in a dissatisfied manner. Inspector Colgate said. Sometimes these quiet ones are the most violent underneath, so to speak. It's all bottled up. He may have been madly fond of her, and madly jealous. But he's not the kind to show it. Poro said slowly. That is possible, yes. He is a very interesting character this Captain Marshall. I interest myself in him greatly. And in his alibi. Alibi by typewriter, said Weston with a short bark of a laugh. What have you got to say about that, Colgate? Inspector Colgate screwed up his eyes. He said. Well, you know, sir, I rather fancy that alibi. It's not too good, if you know what I mean. It's, well, it's natural. And if we find the chambermaid was about, and did hear the typewriter going, well then, it seems to me that it's all right and that we'll have to look elsewhere. Hum, said Colonel Weston. Where are you going to look? For a minute or two the three men pondered the question. Inspector Colgate spoke first. He said. It boils down to this, was it an outsider, or a guest at the hotel? I'm not eliminating the servants entirely, mind, but I don't expect for a minute that we'll find any of them had a hand in it. No, it's a hotel guest, or it's someone from right outside. We've got to look at it this way. First of all, motive. There's gain. The only person to gain by her death was the lady's husband, it seems. What other motives are there? First and foremost, jealousy. It seems to me, just looking at it, that if ever you've got a crime passional, he bowed to Poirot, this is one. Poro murmured as he looked up at the ceiling. There are so many passions. Inspector Colgate went on. Her husband wouldn't allow that she had any enemies, real enemies, that is, but I don't believe for a minute that that's so. I should say that a lady like her would, well, would make some pretty bad enemies, eh, sir, what do you say? Poro responded. He said. Maze we, that is so. Arlena Marshall would make enemies. But in my opinion, the enemy theory is not tenable, for you see, Inspector, Arlena Marshall's enemies would, I think, as I said just now, always be women. Colonel Weston grunted and said. Something in that. It's the women who've got their knife into her here all right. Poro went on. 
it seems to be hardly possible that this crime was committed by a woman. What does the medical evidence say? Weston grunted again. He said, Neeston's pretty confident that she was strangled by a man. Big hands, powerful grip. It's just possible, of course, that an unusually athletic woman might have done it, but it's damned unlikely. Poirot nodded. Exactly. Arsenic in a cup of tea, a box of poison chocolates, a knife, even a pistol, but strangulation, no. It is a man we have to look for. And immediately, he went on, it becomes more difficult. There are two people here in this hotel who have a motive for wishing Arlena Marshall out of the way, but both of them are women. Colonel Weston asked. Redfern's wife is one of them, I suppose. Yes. Mrs. Redfern might have made up her mind to kill Arlena Stewart. She had, let us say, ample cause. I think, too, that it would be possible for Mrs. Redfern to commit a murder. But not this kind of murder. For all her unhappiness and jealousy, she is not, I should say, a woman of strong passions. In love, she would be devoted and loyal, not passionate. As I said just now, arsenic in the teacup, possibly, strangulation, no. I am sure, also, that she is physically incapable of committing this crime, her hands and feet are small, below the average. Weston nodded. He said, this isn't a woman's crime. No, a man did this. Inspector Colgate coughed. Let me put forward a solution, sir. Say that prior to meeting this Mr. Redfern the lady had had another affair with someone, call him X. She turns X down for Mr. Redfern. X is mad with rage and jealousy. He follows her down here, stays somewhere in the neighborhood, comes over to the island, does her in. It's a possibility. Weston said. It's possible, all right. And if it's true, it ought to be easy to prove. Did he come on foot or in a boat? The latter seems more likely. If so, he must have hired a boat somewhere. You'd better make inquiries. He looked across at Poirot. What do you think of Colgate's suggestion? Poirot said slowly. It leaves, somehow, too much to chance. And besides, some of the picture is not true. I cannot, you see, imagine this man, the man who is mad with rage and jealousy. Colgate said. People did go potty about her, though, sir. Look at Redfern. Yes, yes. But all the same. Colgate looked at him questioningly. Poro shook his head. He said, frowning. Somewhere, there is something that we have missed. 6. Colonel Weston was poring over the hotel register. He read aloud. Major and Mrs. Cowan. Miss Pamela Cowan. Master Robert Cowan. Master Evan Cowan. Rydal's Mount, Leatherhead. Mr. and Mrs. Masterman. Mr. Edward Masterman. Miss Jennifer Masterman. Mr. Roy Masterman. Master Frederick Masterman. 5. Marlborough Avenue, London, N.W. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. New York. Mr. and Mrs. Redfern. Crossgates, Selden, Princes Risborough. Major Barry. 18. Cardon Street, St. James, London, S.W.1. Mr. Horace Blatt. 5. Pickerskill Street, London, E.C.2. M. Hercule Poirot. Whitehaven Mansions, London, W.1. Miss Rosamund Darnley. 8. Cardigan Court, W.1. Miss Emily Brewster. Southgates, Sunbury Antems. Rev. Stephen Lane. London. Captain and Mrs. Marshall. Miss Linda Marshall. 73 Upcott Mansions, London, S.W.7. He stopped. Inspector Colgate said. I think, sir, that we can wash out the first two entries, 
Mrs. Castle tells me that the Mastermans and the Collins come here regularly every summer with their children. This morning they went off on an all-day excursion sailing, taking lunch with them. They left just after 9 o'clock. A man called Andrew Baston took them. We can check up from him, but I think we can put them right out of it. Weston nodded. I agree. Let's eliminate everyone we can. Can you give us a pointer on any of the rest of them, Poro? Poro said. Superficially, that is easy. The gardeners are a middle-aged married couple, pleasant, traveled. All the talking is done by the lady. The husband is acquiescent. He plays tennis and golf and has a form of dry humor that is attractive when one gets him to oneself. Sounds quite okay. Next, the Redferns. Mr. Redfern is young, attractive to women, a magnificent swimmer, a good tennis player and accomplished dancer. His wife I have already spoken of to you. She is quiet, pretty in a washed out way. She is, I think, devoted to her husband. She has some thing that Arlena Marshall did not have. What is that? Brains. Inspector Colgate sighed. He said, Brains don't count for much when it comes to an infatuation, sir. Perhaps not. And yet I do truly believe that in spite of his infatuation for Mrs. Marshall, Patrick Redfern really cares for his wife. That may be, sir. It wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Poro murmured. That is the pity of it. It is always the thing women find hardest to believe. He went on. Major Barry. Retired Indian Army. An admirer of women. A teller of long and boring stories. Inspector Colgate sighed. You needn't go on. I've met a few, sir. Mr. Horace Blatt. He is, apparently, a rich man. He talks a good deal about Mr. Blatt. He wants to be everybody's friend. It is sad for nobody likes him very much. And there is something else. Mr. Blatt last night asked me a good many questions. Mr. Blatt was uneasy. Yes, there is something not quite right about Mr. Blatt. He paused and went on with a change of voice. Next comes Miss Rosamund Darnley. Her business name is Rosemond Limited. She is a celebrated dressmaker. What can I say of her? She has brains and charm and chic. She is very pleasing to look at. He paused and added. And she is a very old friend of Captain Marshall's. Weston sat up in his chair. Oh, she is, is she? Yes. They had not met for some years. Weston asked. Did she know he was going to be down here? She says not. Poro paused and then went on. Who comes next? Miss Brewster. I find her just a little alarming. He shook his head. She has a voice like a man's. She is gruff and what you call hardy. She rows boats and has a handicap of four at golf. He paused. I think, though, that she has a good heart. Weston said. That leaves only the Reverend Stephen Lane. Who's the Reverend Stephen Lane? I can only tell you one thing. He is a man who is in a condition of great nervous tension. Also he is, I think, a fanatic. Inspector Colgate said. Oh, that kind of person. Weston said. And that's the lot. He looked at Poirot. You seem very lost in thought, my friend. Poirot said. Yes. Because, you see. When Mrs. Marshall went off this morning and asked me not to tell anyone I had seen her, I jumped at once in my own mind to a certain conclusion. I thought that her friendship with Patrick Redfern had made trouble between her and her husband. I thought that she was going to meet Patrick Redfern somewhere, and that she did not want her husband to know where she was. He paused. But that, you see, was where I was wrong. Because, although her husband appeared almost immediately on the beach and asked if I had seen her, 
Patrick Redfern arrived also, and was most patently and obviously looking for her. And therefore, my friends, I am asking myself, who was it that Arlena Marshall went off to meet? Inspector Colgate said. That fits in with my idea. A man from London or somewhere. Hercule Poirot shook his head. He said. But, my friend, according to your theory, Arlena Marshall had broken with this mythical man. Why, then, should she take such trouble and pains to meet him? Inspector Colgate shook his head. He said. Who do you think it was? That is just what I cannot imagine. We have just read through the list of hotel guests. They are all middle-aged, dull. Which of them would Arlena Marshall prefer to Patrick Redfern? No, that is impossible. And yet, all the same, she did go to meet someone, and that someone was not Patrick Redfern. Weston murmured. You don't think she just went off by herself? Poro shook his head. Mon cher, he said. It is very evident that you never met the dead woman. Somebody once wrote a learned treatise on the difference that solitary confinement would mean to Beau Brummel or to a man like Newton. Arlena Marshall, my dear friend, would practically not exist in solitude. She only lived in the light of a man's admiration. No, Arlena Marshall went to meet someone this morning. Who was it? Colonel Weston sighed, shook his head and said. Well, we can go into theories later. Gotta get through these interviews now. Gotta get it down in black and white where everyone was. I suppose we'd better see the Marshall girl now. She might be able to tell us something useful. Linda Marshall came into the room clumsily, knocking against the doorpost. She was breathing quickly and the pupils of her eyes were dilated. She looked like a startled young colt. Colonel Weston felt a kindly impulse towards her. He thought. Poor kid, she's nothing but a kid after all. This must have been a pretty bad shock to her. He drew up a chair and said in a reassuring voice. Sorry to put you through this, Miss, Linda, isn't it? Yes, Linda. Her voice had that indrawn breathy quality that is often characteristic of schoolgirls. Her hands rested helplessly on the table in front of him, pathetic hands, big and red, with large bones and long wrists. Weston thought. A kid oughtn't to be mixed up in this sort of thing. He said reassuringly. There's nothing very alarming about all this. We just want you to tell us anything you know that might be useful, that's all. Linda said. You mean, about Arlena? Yes. Did you see her this morning at all? The girl shook her head. No. Arlena always gets down rather late. She has breakfast in bed. Hercule Poro said. And you, mademoiselle? Oh, I get up. Breakfast in bed so stuffy. Weston said. Will you tell us what you did this morning? Well, I had a bathe first and then breakfast, and then I went with Mrs. Redfern to Gull Cove. Weston said. What time did you and Mrs. Redfern start? She said she'd be waiting for me in the hall at half past ten. I was afraid I was going to be late, but it was all right. We started off at about three minutes to the half hour. Poro said. And what did you do at Gull Cove? Oh. I oiled myself and sunbathed and Mrs. Redfern sketched. Then, later, I went into the sea and Christine went back to the hotel to get changed for tennis. Weston said, keeping his voice quite casual. Do you remember what time that was? When Mrs. Redfern went back to the hotel? Quarter to twelve. Sure of that time, quarter to twelve? Linda, opening her eyes wide, said. Oh yes. I looked at my watch. The watch you have on now? Linda glanced down at her wrist. Yes. Weston said. Mind if I see? She held our wrist. He compared the watch with his own and with the hotel clock on the wall. He said, smiling. Correct to a second. And after that you had a bathe? Yes. Yes. 
and you got back to the hotel, when? Just about one o'clock. And, and then, I heard, about Arlena. Her voice changed. Colonel Weston said. Did you, er, get on with your stepmother all right? She looked at him for a minute without replying. Then she said. Oh yes. Poro asked. Did you like her, mademoiselle? Linda said again. Oh yes. She added, Arlena was quite kind to me. Weston said with rather uneasy facetiousness. Not the cruel stepmother, eh? Linda shook her head without smiling. Weston said. That's good. That's good. Sometimes, you know, there's a bit of difficulty in families, jealousy, all that. Girl and her father great pals, and then she resents it a bit when he's all wrapped up in the new wife. You didn't feel like that, eh? Linda stared at him. She said with obvious sincerity. Oh no. Weston said. I suppose your father was, er, very wrapped up in her. Linda said simply. I don't know. Weston went on. All sorts of difficulties, as I say, arise in families. Quarrels, rows, that sort of thing. If husband and wife get ratty with each other, that's a bit awkward for a daughter too. Anything of that sort? Linda said clearly. Do you mean, did father and Arlena quarrel? Well, yes. Weston thought to himself. Rotten business, questioning a child about her father. Why is one a policeman? Damn it all, it's got to be done, though. Linda said positively. Oh no. She added, father doesn't quarrel with people. He's not like that at all. Weston said. Now, Miss Linda, I want you to think very carefully. Have you any idea at all who might have killed your stepmother? Is there anything you've ever heard or anything you know that could help us on that point? Linda was silent a minute. She seemed to be giving the question a serious unhurried consideration. She said at last. No, I don't know who could have wanted to kill Arlena. She added, except, of course, Mrs. Redfern. Weston said. You think Mrs. Redfern wanted to kill her? Why? Linda said. Because her husband was in love with Arlena. But I don't think she would really want to kill her. I mean she'd just feel that she wished she was dead, and that isn't the same thing at all, is it? Poirot said gently. No, it is not at all the same. Linda nodded. A queer sort of spasm passed across her face. She said. And anyway, Mrs. Redfern could never do a thing like that, kill anybody. She isn't, she isn't violent, if you know what I mean. Weston and Poro nodded. The latter said. I know exactly what you mean, my child, and I agree with you. Mrs. Redfern is not of those who, as your saying goes, sees red. She would not be, he leaned back half closing his eyes, picking his words with care, shaken by a storm of feeling, seeing life narrowing in front of her, seeing a hated face, a hated white neck, feeling her hands clench, longing to feel them press into flesh. He stopped. Linda moved jerkily back from the table. She said in a trembling voice. Can I go now? Is that all? Colonel Weston said. Yes, yes, that's all. Thank you. Miss Linda. He got up to open the door for her. Then came back to the table and lit a cigarette. Phew, he said. Not a nice job, ours. I can tell you I felt a bit of a cat questioning that child about the relations between her father and her stepmother. More or less inviting a daughter to put a rope round her father's neck. All the same, it had to be done. Murder is murder and she's the person most likely to know the truth of things. I'm rather thankful, though, that she'd nothing to tell us in that line. Poro said. Yes, I thought you were. Weston said with an embarrassed cough. By the way, Poro, you went a bit far, I thought at the end. All that hand sinking into flesh business, 
not quite the sort of idea to put into a kid's head. Hercule Poirot looked at him with thoughtful eyes. He said, So you thought I put ideas into her head? Well, didn't you? Come now. Poro shook his head. Weston sheared away from the point. He said, On the whole we got very little useful stuff out of her. Except a more or less complete alibi for the Redfern woman. If they were together from half past ten to a quarter to twelve that lets Christine Redfern out of it. Exit the jealous wife suspect. Poro said. There are better reasons than that for leaving Mrs. Redfern out of it. It would, I am convinced, be physically impossible and mentally impossible for her to strangle anyone. She is cold rather than warm-blooded, capable of deep devotion and unswerving constancy, but not of hot-blooded passion or rage. Moreover, her hands are far too small and delicate. Colgate said. I agree with M. Poirot. She's out of it. Dr. Neeston says it was a full-sized pair of hands that throttled that dame. Weston said. Well, I suppose we'd better see the Red Ferns next. I expect he's recovered a bit from the shock now. Patrick Redfern had recovered full composure by now. He looked pale and haggard and suddenly very young, but his manner was quite composed. You are Mr. Patrick Redfern of Crossgates, Selden, Princes Risborough? Yes. How long had you known Mrs. Marshall? Patrick Redfern hesitated, then said. Three months. Weston went on. Captain Marshall has told us that you and she met casually at a cocktail party. Is that right? Yes, that's how it came about. Weston said. Captain Marshall has implied that until you both met down here you did not know each other well. Is that the truth, Mr. Redfern? Again Patrick Redfern hesitated a minute. Then he said. Well, not exactly. As a matter of fact I saw a fair amount of her one way and another. Without Captain Marshall's knowledge? Redfern flushed slightly. He said. I don't know whether he knew about it or not. Hercule Poirot spoke. He murmured. And was it also without your wife's knowledge, Mr. Redfern? I believe I mentioned to my wife that I had met the famous Arlena Stewart. Poro persisted. But she did not know how often you were seeing her. Well, perhaps not. Weston said. Did you and Mrs. Marshall arrange to meet down here? Redfern was silent a minute or two. Then he shrugged his shoulders. Oh well, he said. I suppose it's bound to come out now. It's no good my fencing with you. I was crazy about the woman, mad, infatuated, anything you like. She wanted me to come down here. I demurred a bit and then I agreed. I, I, well, I would have agreed to do any mortal thing she liked. She had that kind of effect on people. Hercule Poirot murmured. You paint a very clear picture of her. She was the eternal Circe. Just that. Patrick Redfern said bitterly. She turned men into swine all right. He went on, I'm being frank with you, gentlemen. I'm not going to hide anything. What's the use? As I say, I was infatuated with her. Whether she cared for me or not, I don't know. She pretended to but I think she was one of those women who lose interest in a man once they've got him body and soul. She knew she'd got me all right. This morning, when I found her there on the beach, dead, it was as though, he paused, as though something had hit me straight between the eyes. I was dazed, knocked out. Poro leaned forward. And now? Patrick Redfern met his eyes squarely. He said, I've told you the truth. What I want to ask is this, how much of it has got to be made public? It's not as though it could have any bearing on her death. And if it all comes out, it's going to be pretty rough on my wife. Oh, I know, he went on quickly. You think I haven't thought much about her up to now? Perhaps that's true. But, though I may sound the worst kind of hypocrite, the real truth is that I care for my wife, care for her very deeply.
The other, he twitched his shoulders, it was a madness, the kind of idiotic fool thing men do, but Christine is different. She's real. Badly as I've treated her, I've known all along, deep down, that she was the person who really counted. He paused, sighed, and said rather pathetically, I wish I could make you believe that. Hercule Poirot leant forward. He said, But I do believe it. Yes, yes, I do believe it. Patrick Redfern looked at him gratefully. He said, Thank you. Colonel Weston cleared his throat. He said, You may take it, Mr. Redfern, that we shall not go into irrelevancies. If your infatuation for Mrs. Marshall played no part in the murder then there will be no point in dragging it into the case. But what you don't seem to realize is that that, er, intimacy, may have a very direct bearing on the murder. It might establish, you understand, a motive for the crime. Patrick Redfern said. Motive? Weston said. Yes, Mr. Redfern, motive. Captain Marshall, perhaps, was unaware of the affair. Suppose that he suddenly found out? Redfern said. Oh God! You mean he got wise and, and killed her? The chief constable said rather dryly. That solution had not occurred to you? Redfern shook his head. He said. No, funny. I never thought of it. You see, Marshall's such a quiet chap. I, oh, it doesn't seem likely. Weston asked. What was Mrs. Marshall's attitude to her husband in all this? Was she, well, uneasy, in case it should come to his ears? Or was she indifferent? Redfern said slowly. She was, a bit any. Revous. She didn't want him to suspect anything. Did she seem afraid of him? Afraid? No, I wouldn't say that. Poro murmured. Excuse me, M. Redfern, there was not, at any time, the question of a divorce? Patrick Redfern shook his head decisively. Oh no, there was no question of anything like that. There was Christine, you see. And Arlena, I am sure, never thought of such a thing. She was perfectly satisfied married to Marshall. He's, well, rather a big bug in his way, he smiled suddenly. County, all that sort of thing, and quite well off. She never thought of me as a possible husband. No, I was just one of a succession of poor mutts, just something to pass the time with. I knew that all along, and yet, queerly enough, it didn't alter my feeling towards her. His voice trailed off. He sat there thinking. Weston recalled him to the needs of the moment. Now, Mr. Redfern, had you any particular appointment with Mrs. Marshall this morning? Patrick Redfern looked slightly puzzled. He said. Not a particular appointment, no. We usually met every morning on the beach. We used to paddle about on floats. Were you surprised not to find Mrs. Marshall there this morning? Yes. I was. Very surprised. I couldn't understand it at all. What did you think? Well, I didn't know what to think. I mean, all the time I thought she would be coming. If she were keeping an appointment elsewhere you had no idea with whom that appointment might be. Patrick Redfern merely stared and shook his head. When you had a rendezvous with Mrs. Marshall, where did you meet? Well, sometimes I'd meet her in the afternoon down at Gull Cove. You see the sun is off Gull Cove in the afternoon and so there aren't usually many people there. We met there once or twice. Never on the other cove? Pixie Cove? No. You see Pixie Cove faces west and people go round there in boats or on floats in the afternoon. We never tried to meet in the morning. It would have been too noticeable. In the afternoon people go and have a sleep or mouch around and nobody knows much where anyone else is. Weston nodded. Patrick Redfern went on. After dinner, of course, on the fine nights, we used to go off for a stroll together to different parts of the island. Hercule Poirot murmured. Ah, yes, 
and Patrick Redfern shot him an inquiring glance. Weston said. Then you can give us no help whatsoever as to the cause that took Mrs. Marshall to Pixie Cove this morning? Redfern shook his head. He said, and his voice sounded honestly bewildered. I haven't the faintest idea. It wasn't like Arlena. Weston said. Had she any friends down here staying in the neighborhood? Not that I know of. Oh, I'm sure she hadn't. Now, Mr. Redfern, I want you to think very carefully. You knew Mrs. Marshall in London. You must be acquainted with various members of her circle. Is there anyone you know of who could have had a grudge against her? Someone, for instance, whom you may have supplanted in her fancy. Patrick Redfern thought for some minutes. Then he shook his head. Honestly, he said. I can't think of anyone. Colonel Weston drummed with his fingers on the table. He said at last. Well, that's that. We seem to be left with three possibilities. That of an unknown killer, some monomaniac, who happened to be in the neighborhood, and that's a pretty tall order. Redfern said, interrupting. And yet surely, it's by far the most likely explanation. Weston shook his head. He said. This isn't one of the lonely cop's murders. This cove place was pretty inaccessible. Either the man would have to come up from the causeway past the hotel, over the top of the island and down by that ladder contraption, or else he came there by boat. Either way is unlikely for a casual killing. Patrick Redfern said. You said there were three possibilities. Um, yes, said the chief constable. That's to say, there were two people on this island who had a motive for killing her. Her husband, for one, and your wife for another. Redfern stared at him. He looked dumbfounded. He said. My wife? Christine? Do you mean that Christine had anything to do with this? He got up and stood there stammering slightly in his incoherent haste to get the words out. You're mad, quite mad, Christine. Why, it's impossible. It's laughable. Weston said. All the same, Mr. Redfern, jealousy is a very powerful motive. Women who are jealous lose control of themselves completely. Redfern said earnestly. Not Christine. She's, oh she's not like that. She was unhappy, yes. But she's not the kind of person to, oh, there's no violence in her. Hercule Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Violence. The same word that Linda Marshall had used. As before, he agreed with the sentiment. Besides, went on Redfern confidently. It would be absurd. Arlena was twice as strong physically as Christine. I doubt if Christine could strangle a kitten, certainly not a strong wiry creature like Arlena. And then Christine could never have got down that ladder to the beach. She has no head for that sort of thing. And, oh, the whole thing is fantastic. Colonel Weston scratched his ear tentatively. Well, he said. Put like that it doesn't seem likely. I grant you that. But motive's the first thing we've got to look for. He added, motive and opportunity. When Redfern had left the room, the chief constable observed with a slight smile. Didn't think it necessary to tell the fellow his wife had got an alibi. Wanted to hear what he'd have to say to the idea. Shook him up a bit, didn't it? Hercule Poirot murmured. The arguments he advanced were quite as strong as any alibi. Yes. Oh. She didn't do it. She couldn't have done it, physically impossible as you said. Marshall could have done it, but apparently he didn't. Inspector Colgate coughed. He said. Excuse me, sir, I've been thinking about that alibi. It's possible, you know, if he'd thought this thing out, that those letters were got ready beforehand. Weston said. That's a good idea. We must look into. He broke off as Christine Redfern entered the room. She was, as always, calm and a little precise in manner. She was wearing a white tennis frock and a pale blue pullover.
it accentuated her fair, rather anemic prettiness. Yet, Hercule Poirot thought to himself, it was neither a silly face nor a weak one. It had plenty of resolution, courage, and good sense. He nodded appreciatively. Colonel Weston thought. Nice little woman. Bit wishy-washy, perhaps. A lot too good for that philandering young ass of a husband of hers. Oh well, the boy's young. Women usually make a fool of you once. He said. Sit down, Mrs. Redfern. We've got to go through a certain amount of routine, you see. Asking everybody for an account of their movements this morning. Just for our records. Christine Redfern nodded. She said in her quiet, precise voice. Oh yes, I quite understand. Where do you want me to begin? Hercule Poro said. As early as possible, madam. What did you do when you first got up this morning? Christine said. Let me see. On my way down to breakfast I went into Linda M. Arshall's room and fixed up with her to go to Gull Cove this morning. We agreed to meet in the lounge at half past ten. Poro asked. You did not bathe before breakfast, madam? No. I very seldom do. She smiled. I like the sea well warm before I get into it. I'm rather a chilly person. But your husband bathes then? Oh, yes. Nearly always. And Mrs. Marshall, she also? A change came over Christine's voice. It became cold and almost acrid. She said. Oh no, Mrs. Marshall was the sort of person who never made an appearance before the middle of the morning. With an air of confusion, Hercule Poirot said. Pardon, madam, I interrupted you. You were saying that you went to Miss Linda Marshall's room. What time was that? Let me see, half past eight, no, a little later. And was Miss Marshall up then? Oh yes, she had been out. Out? Yes, she said she'd been bathing. There was a faint, a very faint note of embarrassment in Christine's voice. It puzzled Hercule Poirot. Weston said. And then? Then I went down to breakfast. And after breakfast? I went upstairs, collected my sketching box and sketching book and we started out. You and Miss Linda Marshall? Yes. What time was that? I think it was just on half past ten. And what did you do? We went to Gull Cove. You know, the cove on the east side of the island. We settled ourselves there. I did a sketch and Linda sunbathed. What time did you leave the cove? At a quarter to twelve. I was playing tennis at twelve and had to change. You had your watch with you? No. As a matter of fact I hadn't. I asked Linda the time. I see. And then? I packed up my sketching things and went back to the hotel. Poro said. And Mademoiselle Linda? Linda? Oh, Linda went into the sea. Poro said. Were you far from the sea where you were sitting? Well, we were well above high water mark just under the cliff, so that I could be a little in the shade and Linda in the sun. Poro said. Did Linda Marshall actually enter the sea before you left the beach? Christine frowned a little in the effort to remember. She said. Let me see. She ran down the beach, I fastened my box, yes, I heard her splashing in the waves as I was on the path up the cliff. You are sure of that, madam? That she really entered the sea? Oh yes. She stared at him in surprise. Colonel Weston also stared at him. Then he said. Go on, Mrs. Redfern. I went back to the hotel, changed, and went to the tennis courts where I met the others. Who were? Captain Marshall, Mr. Gardner, and Miss Darnley. We played two sets. We were just going in again when the news came about, about Mrs. Marshall. Hercule Poirot leant forward. He said. And what did you think, madam, when you heard that news? What did I think? 
Her face showed a faint distaste for the question. Yes. Christine Redfern said slowly. It was a horrible thing to happen. Ah, yes, your fastidiousness was revolted. I understand that. But what did it mean to you, personally? She gave him a quick look, a look of appeal. He responded to it. He said in a matter-of-fact voice. I am appealing to you, madam, as a woman of intelligence with plenty of good sense and judgment. You had doubtless during your stay here formed an opinion of Mrs. Marshall, of the kind of woman she was? Christine said cautiously. I suppose one always does that more or less when one is staying in hotels. Certainly, it is the natural thing to do. So I ask you, madam, were you really very surprised at the manner of her death? Christine said slowly. I think I see what you mean. No, I was not, perhaps, surprised. Shocked, yes. But she was the kind of woman. Poro finished the sentence for her. She was the kind of woman to whom such a thing might happen. Yes, madam, that is the truest and most significant thing that has been said in this room this morning. Laying all, er, he stressed it carefully, personal feeling aside, what did you really think of the late Mrs. Marshall? Christine Redfern said calmly. Is it really worthwhile going into all that now? I think it might be, yes. Well, what shall I say? Her fair skin was suddenly suffused with color. The careful poise of her manner was relaxed. For a short space the natural raw woman looked out. She's the kind of woman that to my mind is absolutely worthless. She did nothing to justify her existence. She had no mind, no brains. She thought of nothing but men and clothes and admiration. Useless, a parasite. She was attractive to men, I suppose, oh, of course, she was. And she lived for that kind of life. And so, I suppose, I wasn't really surprised at her coming to a sticky end. She was the sort of woman who would be mixed up with everything sordid, blackmail, jealousy, violence, every kind of crude emotion. She, she appealed to the worst in people. She stopped, panting a little. Her rather short top lip lifted itself in a kind of fastidious disgust. It occurred to Colonel Weston that you could not have found a more complete contrast to Arlena Stewart than Christine Redfern. It also occurred to him that if you were married to Christine Redfern, the atmosphere might be so rarefied that the Arlena Stewarts of this world would hold a particular attraction for you. And then, immediately following on these thoughts, a single word out of the words she had spoken fastened on his attention with particular intensity. He leaned forward and said, Mrs. Redfern, why, in speaking of her, did you mention the word blackmail? 7. Christine stared at him, not seeming at once to take in what he meant. She answered almost mechanically. I suppose, because she was being blackmailed. She was the sort of person who would be. Colonel Weston said earnestly. But, do you know she was being blackmailed? A faint color rose in the girl's cheeks. She said rather awkwardly. As a matter of fact I do happen to know it. I, I overheard something. Will you explain, Mrs. Redfern? Flushing still more, Christine Redfern said. I, I didn't mean to overhear. It was an accident. It was two, no, three nights ago. We were playing bridge. She turned towards Poirot. You remember? My husband and I, M, Poirot and Miss Darnley. I was dummy. It was very stuffy in the card room, and I slipped out of the window for a breath of fresh air. I went down towards the beach and I suddenly heard voices. One, it was Arlena Marshall's. I knew it at once, said, it's no good pressing me. I can't get any more money now. My husband will suspect something. And then a man's voice said, I'm not taking any excuses. You've got to cough up. And then Arlena Marshall said, you blackmailing brute. And the man said, brute or not, you'll pay up, my lady. Christine paused. 
I turned back in a minute after Arlena Marshall rushed past me. She looked, well, frightfully upset. Weston said. And the man? Do you know who he was? Christine Redfern shook her head. She said. He was keeping his voice low. I barely heard what he said. It didn't suggest the voice to you of anyone you knew? She thought again, but once more shook her head. She said. No, I don't know. It was gruff and low. It, oh, it might have been anybody's. Colonel Weston said. Thank you, Mrs. Redfern. When the door had closed behind Christine Redfern, Inspector Colgate said. Now we are getting somewhere. Weston said. You think so, eh? Well, it's suggestive, sir, you can't get away from it. Somebody in this hotel was blackmailing the lady. Poirot murmured. But it is not the wicked blackmailer who lies dead. It is the victim. That's a bit of a setback, I agree, said the inspector. Blackmailers aren't in the habit of bumping off their victims. But what it does give us is this, it suggests a reason for Mrs. Marshall's curious behavior this morning. She'd got a rendezvous with this fellow who was blackmailing her, and she didn't want either her husband or Redfern to know about it. It certainly explains that point, agreed Poirot. Inspector Colgate went on. And think of the place chosen. The very spot for the purpose. The lady goes off in her float. That's natural enough. It's what she does every day. She goes round to Pixie Cove where no one ever goes in the morning and which will be a nice quiet place for an interview. Poro said. But yes, I too was struck by that point. It is as you say, an ideal spot for a rendezvous. It is deserted, it is only accessible from the land side by descending a vertical steel ladder which is not everybody's money, bien entendu. Moreover most of the beach is invisible from above because of the overhanging cliff. And it has another advantage. Mr. Redfern told me of that one day. There is a cave on it, the entrance to which is not easy to find but where anyone could wait unseen. Weston said. Of course, the Pixies Cave, remember hearing about it. Inspector Colgate said. Haven't heard it spoken of for years, though. We'd better have a look inside it. Never know, we might find a pointer of some. Kind. Weston said. Yes, you're right, Colgate, we've got the solution to part one of the puzzle. Why did Mrs. Marshall go to Pixie's Cove? We want the other half of that solution, though. Who did she go there to meet? Presumably someone staying in this hotel. None of them fitted as a lover, but a blackmailer's a different proposition. He drew the register towards him. Excluding the waiters, boots, etc., whom I don't think likely, we've got the following. The American, Gardner, Major Barry, Mr. Horace Blatt, and the Reverend Stephen Lane. Inspector Colgate said. We can narrow it down a bit, sir. We might almost rule out the American, I think. He was on the beach all the morning. That's so, isn't it, M. Poro? Poro replied. He was absent for a short time when he fetched a skein of wool for his wife. Colgate said. Oh well, we needn't count that. Weston said. And what about the other three? Major Barry went out at 10 o'clock this morning. He returned at 1.30. Mr. Lane was earlier still. He breakfasted at 8. Said he was going for a tramp. Mr. Blatt went off for a sail at 9.30 same as he does most days. Neither of them are back yet. A sail, eh? Colonel Weston's voice was thoughtful. Inspector Colgate's voice was responsive. He said. Might fit in rather well, sir. Weston said. Well, we'll have a word with this major bloke, and let me see. Who else is there? Rosamund Darnley. And there's the Brewster woman who found the body with red fern. What's she like, Colgate? Oh, a sensible party, sir. No nonsense about her, 
She didn't express any opinions on the death? The inspector shook his head. I don't think she'll have anything more to tell us, sir, but we'll have to make sure. Then there are the Americans. Colonel Weston nodded. He said, let's have them all in and get it over as soon as possible. Never know, might learn something. About the blackmailing stunt if about nothing else. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner came into the presence of authority together. Mrs. Gardner explained immediately. I hope you'll understand how it is, Colonel Weston, that is the name, I think. Reassured on this point she went on, but this has been a very bad shock to me and Mr. Gardner is always very, very careful of my health. Mr. Gardner here interpolated. Mrs. Gardner, he said, is very sensitive. And he said to me, why, Carrie, he said, naturally I'm coming right along with you. It's not that we haven't the highest admiration for British police methods, because we have. I've been told that British police procedure is most refined and delicate, and I've never doubted it, and certainly when I once had a bracelet missing at the Savoy Hotel nothing could have been more lovely and sympathetic than the young man who came to see me about it, and, of course, I hadn't really lost the bracelet at all, but just mislaid it, that's the worst of rushing about so much, it makes you kind of forgetful where you put things. Mrs. Gardner paused, inhaled gently and started off. Again. And what I say is, and I know Mr. Gardner agrees with me, that we're only too anxious to do anything to help the British police in every way. So go right ahead and ask me anything at all you want to know. Colonel Weston opened his mouth to comply with this invitation, but had momentarily to postpone speech while Mrs. Gardner went on. That's what I said, Odell, isn't it? And that's so, isn't it? Yes, darling, said Mr. Gardner. Colonel Weston spoke hastily. I understand, Mrs. Gardner, that you and your husband were on the beach all the morning? For once Mr. Gardner was able to get in first. That's so, he said. Why, certainly we were, said Mrs. Gardner. In a lovely peaceful morning it was, just like any other morning if you get me, perhaps even more so and not the slightest idea in our minds of what was happening round the corner on that lonely beach. Did you see Mrs. Marshall at all today? We did not. And I said to Odell, why wherever can Mrs. Marshall have got to this morning? I said. And first her husband coming looking for her and then that good-looking young man, Mr. Redfern, and so impatient he was, just sitting there on the beach scowling at everyone and everything. And I said to myself why, when he has that nice pretty little wife of his own, must he go running after that dreadful woman? Because that's just what I felt she was. I always felt that about her, didn't I, Odell? Yes, darling. However that nice Captain Marshall came to marry such a woman I just cannot imagine and with that nice young daughter growing up, and it's so important for girls to have the right influence. Mrs. Marshall was not at all the right person no breeding at all, and I should say a very animal nature. Now if Captain Marshall had had any sense he'd have married Miss Darnley, who's a very very charming woman and a very distinguished one. I must say I admire the way she's gone straight ahead and built up a first class business as she has. It takes brains to do a thing like that, and you've only got to look at Rosamund Darnley to see she's just frantic with brains. She could plan and carry out any moral thing she liked. I just admire that woman more than I can say. And I said to Mr. Gardner the other day that anyone could see she was very much in love with Captain Marshall, crazy about him was what I said, didn't I, Odell? Yes, darling. It seems they knew each other as children, and why now, who knows, it may all come right after all with that woman out of the way. I'm not a narrow-minded woman, Colonel Weston, and it isn't that I disapprove of the stage as such, why? quite a lot of my best friends are actresses, but I've said to Mr. Gardner all along that there was something evil about that woman. And you see, I've been proved right. She paused triumphantly. The lips of Hercule Poirot quivered in a little smile. His eyes met for a minute the shrewd gray eyes of Mr. Gardner. Colonel Weston said rather desperately. Well, thank you, Mrs. Gardner.
I suppose there's nothing that either of you has noticed since you've been here that might have a bearing upon the case? Why no? I don't think so. Mr. Gardner spoke with a slow drawl. Mrs. Marshall was around with young Redfern most of the time, but everybody can tell you that. What about her husband? Did he mind, do you think? 